お待たせをいたしました。改めまして本日のご多忙の中、ブロックチェーンの健全な発展と新しいビジネス創造のためにご参加、そしてご視聴を賜りまして誠にありがとうございます。ではお時間となりましたのでこれより。分散化、デジタル化される世界と経営層とポリシーメーカーが知るべき未来とインパクトをテーマに機能を行わせていただきます。キーチェーン共同創業者兼 CEO、ジョナサン・ホープさんにお声を頂戴いたします。それではご登場いただきます。Mr. Hope, if you please. So、uh, let us invite him to take the floor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining.、Uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be here at the Nikkei Summit. Today, I want to talk to you about a subject that is very, very near and dear to my heart.、Um, and today's talk is directed mostly towards、uh, business leaders today, policymakers, as well as there'll be something in here for technologists. And well, we, we need to talk. Uh, the other day, I went to buy a new phone, and I discovered upon a little bit of research that I couldn't really buy this phone that I wanted because the application that runs on this phone、uh, is connecting to a service in the US, a Google service, which is banned to operate on the phone that I, that I wanted to buy. And what I've come to realize is that the issue of distrusted networks has really come down. Come to home when we can't buy the, the technology that we want to buy,、uh, specifically when we talk about Huawei and Google. Now, what's happened is that we've gotten into a position where banning technology on an international scale has been a method, or maybe the only method policymakers have, in order to navigate what I consider a very、um, important problem in the Digital world, and that's the fact that digital, the digital world is untrusted. So, today we're going to talk about this problem, and I want to drill down and try to break it down a little bit in more detail exactly what is going on here in terms of technology and the problems and the misalignments that are, that are, that are, that are happening now. And I want to offer a suggestion, a proposal of looking at this problem in a slightly different way. And applying technology that we have today in a way that could allow policymakers to think about how to deal with this problem differently than banning technology. So, the problem we're going to talk about first is why is this happening? And to what end are we heading towards、uh, when we talk about these types of things? The problem, I, I like to call it the technology agency problem. Uh, and we'll dig into that and we'll describe that in a little bit more detail. We'll talk about a new approach of using tools that we have today towards addressing that problem. And we'll talk about visions and use cases for that、uh, going forward. Okay, so when we talk about the real issue that, that's, that we're dealing with here, Um, when you read the, the, the stories about what's happening with the、uh, banning of these technology companies,、uh, the often cited use case or, or the, the problem that we're, that we're facing here is the issue of national security,、uh, whether data that resides in some technology vendor's data store、uh, is safe to do so, to, to place there simply because、um, you know, whether or not the, that particular vendor is trusted or not.、Uh, and this goes. Sp- it, Directly to the problem that we call the agency problem. Now, a little bit of history.、Uh, in the old days of technology infrastructure,、uh, the global e-、uh, economic, I mean,、uh, global companies, financial institutions, and, and the like, we used to see that all of the data and all the processes were stored in a、um, ultra secure data center.、Uh, and the way that company would secure their data. Was typically through what I call outer perimeter security. You secure the network、uh, so you keep hackers out of the network so that you can protect the data that exists inside the network. And that sort of ha- has sort of evolved with the usage of mobile devices, 
people bringing their own devices to work. And so you had a much more heterogeneous mixture of composition of devices that were being used. And you can sort of tell that this idea of protecting the outer network sort of becomes less and less viable because it's not simply a question of whether a hacker can get into your data center. The reality is, is that the hacker could be anywhere. The hacker could be in your office. The, the hacker could be an employee. And you have to think about how do we deal with a situation? How do we navigate the space now where we have even more diverse devices that are being used? IoT devices, uh, mobile devices, smartwatches, uh, edge devices, fog devices, servers, microservices that are provided by other cloud providers, right? The question here is that whether a company can trust those services enough uh, in order to um, continue along this sort of mode of protecting your data. And the issue, the, the reality of that is that the answer is no. Uh, I'll give you a really good example. So uh, a year or two ago, uh, Capital One Bank in America um, faced a cybersecurity hack uh, where a lot of their customer data had been posted on the internet. It was posted on the internet by a former employee of the cloud vendor uh, which had housed their, their data. Now, what's, what's really interesting about that particular question is that Capital One is a bank and they have certain reputational risks, they have liabilities, they could be fined by the regulators. However, however, the technology vendor has little or accepts very little or no liability in that situation. And in fact, I think the news just came out maybe a couple of weeks ago that Capital One was Bank was fined $80 million as a result of that breach. I wonder what li Amazon's liability to Capital One Bank was. Another example, uh, people are using social network applications on their phone, uh, Facebook and, and the like. Now, let's think of a situation where the person who runs these apps uh, happens to be someone in a very important position in the government. Uh, some of these apps will allow advertisers to get information about the, the person, you know, their, their click behavior, even their position. And what very, people, very few people understand is that by meshing the position data uh, with other data that's publicly available, an advertiser, quote unquote advertiser of these, comp these companies um, could correlate the potential um, dealings of that, that individual while they're at work. So, uh, you know, one of these, hypothetically, one of these companies could ascertain what are, what are the dealings of a high-ranking government official just by looking at their location um, data on a daily day-to-day ba -day basis. They can, they can deduce which potential clients a company is discussing business with based on this geographic data. And so data is leaking in very important ways that even we are not very um, cognizant of. And so this highlights what I call the technology agency problem. And that problem is simply said, a misbalance between the responsibility of technology companies with the amount of liability that they're able to accept. Uh, put it, to put it more simply, in the very simple terms, how do I get data from person A to person B when the data flows through some infrastructure C? How do I do that safely and securely when the infrastructure vendor C has very little liability in the event that they're, they are hacked or something happens to that data? There's an imbalance there. If you look at, at the Capital One situation, Capital One Bank had huge downsides to the data hack, whereas Amazon probably had very little. That's what we call the agency problem with respect to technology. And it exists everywhere. Uh, and, and I submit to you that this agency problem is, in fact, the core question and the problem that policymakers are having to deal with when they start to ban these applications, TikTok, Huawei, and, and so forth. Now, one thing very important to understand is that this problem doesn't really ask the question 
of whether these technology vendors are good or whether they're trustworthy. What we want to understand is that it doesn't really matter whether they are trustworthy or not. The problem is that we are, we've put ourselves, allowed ourselves to get into a position where they are trusted in the first place. So I think we should look at that. Can we, can we construct a world in which technology is used, we use these cloud providers, we use networks, we use app services, but we don't entrust data security to the third party that has very little liability to us. Okay. And so I want to impress upon you that a new infrastructure is needed, a data-centric uh, infrastructure that protects data regardless of where the data resides. And most importantly, if we had such an infrastructure, if we had an infrastructure such that every device could securely end-to-end -end, um, transmit data, regardless of what the, the inner part of it is, then it is plausible that policymakers may not have to ban any technology vendors, whether it's for 5G networks, whether it's for particular applications, or what, what, what have you. If this concept is employed, if we could achieve this, then we might get to a situation where that is the, a thing of the past. Okay, so I would like to allow me to position, uh, pose to you an approach to this problem uh, using what I call a modern blockchain architecture. Obviously, blockchain is very, uh, I think, is going to be a very key component of this. Now, I'll explain why. But I want to, you guys to note that the use of blockchain in what we call this modern blockchain architecture is slightly different than what you have been um, accustomed to hearing. The point of this approach is to focus on solving these questions around data, data um, authenticity, data confidentiality, or what we call it data providence, which is the sort of the lineage of data. Where has it come from? Who signed this data? Who created this data? If we apply blockchain to that, um, to that problem, that question, we start to go down this road of what we call the modern yeah, blockchain architecture. The aim of this approach is to obviously to integrate into existing systems, so to contrast that from, say, a smart contract system. We want to integrate into existing systems so that we can uh, uh, secure data that exists outside the blockchain. And we use a hybrid blockchain approach. It's, it's based on blockchain for certain functionalities that I'll get into. And then we use DLT technology in order to facilitate um, fast consensus at um, upper layers. Now, one thing has to be very well understood here, uh, and that is that most blockchain um, uh, frameworks and solutions have really focused on a, only a certain class of problems that exist in the, in the enterprise space. And that's just, this is what really differentiates this modern blockchain approach from other um, technologies. If you look at most blockchain projects, they will focus on some of the well-known functions of finance, uh, digital payments, for example, remittance, some form of digital assets. Those are the things that are, that are easily seen in the financial space. Uh, even smart contract systems will focus on contracts and workflows relating to those types of digital assets. But people in finance uh, who've worked in capital markets, particularly technologists, understand one important insight, and that is that often, oftentimes the data about a certain transaction, with the circumstances under which it was, it was um, processed, uh, and like the reasons why the transaction happened, and by whom the, traction, uh, the transaction uh, occurred, and uh, who's approved that transaction, is often more important than the transaction itself. And so this, this is why this slide here shows that, in fact, there's a hidden portion that is much more important than most of the transactions that happen in, uh, in the space because it all pertains about data relating to the transaction and why it happened, what are the circumstances that, that, that um, made the transaction come to be. 
And what we want to do with this modern blockchain approach is to focus on that problem first. And then once you've done that, you can solve these other problems related to remittance very easily. Okay, so we take a layered approach to this problem. Um, what we do is we use the blockchain for, as the base layer, the blockchain provides a high level of security for establishing a, a digital identity. Uh, you know, we put um, cryptographic identity information onto the blockchain, and that allows us to authenticate and secure data that exists outside the blockchain for other purposes. But the fir first and foremost purpose of the blockchain is, is for this digital identity. By digital identity, I don't mean you know, pictures of passports or, or numbers, um, arbitrary numbers that are given to you. These are specifically cryptographic information. Uh, you can imagine these as um, digital certificates and so forth. At the higher levels, we then apply operations that protect the data. The data doesn't touch the blockchain. The blockchain has no information. There's no information on the blockchain that is identifying of any person outside of the blockchain. Uh, this is just a, a bunch of cryptographic information. But the data on top of that uh, is secured using those, those, um, those parameters. We apply a layer of middleware, which allows us to do um, sending and receiving the data very securely, including end-to-end -end encryption and digital signatures. And then finally, we can do operations, higher level operations on top of that, which will allow us to do fast consensus and financial uh, uh, applications on top of that. So, so why do this? And what, what does this give us? Number one, it gives us a basis for self-agency for the, for the users. Okay. Users manage their own keys. They manage their own self-sovereign identity. They manage the parameters that are related to the providence and security of data that exists outside the blockchain. Self-agency, that's very important. And this will apply not only to users who are using this, for, for example, on a mobile phone or a PC. This applies, this framework applies all the way up to financial institutions themselves establishing their own digital identity in this space. Uh, so you can imagine um, brokers and um, excuse me, uh, capital markets firms, regulators, governments, establishing their cryptographic identity in the same way. In the same way that it scales up, it also scales down as well. So we want to be able to use this as well as a way to provide the same capability to very small devices. So you can imagine the same concept being applied to IoT devices, um, smartwatches, um, sensors, and so forth so that every device gets their digital identity, and then every device can self-manage the access control, confidentiality, and uh, um, provenance of the data that they, that they deal with. And finally, this shifts that sort of method that I mentioned earlier of an outer perimeter security that's, that was the old method in which enterprises would secure data. It shifts that focus into what I call an inner perimeter security. That is, you're securing the data is itself, and the data has the same benefits and the same security guarantees, regardless of where the data resides. And now you can see how this applies to the problem that I mentioned earlier, the, the, the agency problem, and as well, the problem of uh, you know, whether or not we can trust certain technology vendors for infrastructure. It applies because this simple observation, if you could realize these capabilities, these benefits. Internet encrypt your data, digitally sign it, so that every device has a digital identity. Then you don't really care whether the network is, um, is provided from a company that exists in a jurisdiction which is politically misaligned to your country, right? You don't have to care about whether you can trust a cloud provider. You don't have to care about whether a particular service is favorable to your political ideas or not, because the data is secured regardless whether where, where it resides. You're just using these infrastructures as a, as a dumb pipe. And so the, 
what I want to talk about here is that for people who understand that this is important and want to think about how we can get to a world in which this is deployed and, and possible, uh, I want to impress upon you the fact that this technology exists today. Uh, and in fact, some of the techniques I've mentioned have been used by people in the, the cryptocurrency space, block, uh, Bitcoiners in particular, uh, for, for several years now. Uh, but we in particular, Keychain, we've taken this idea and we've taken it to its logical conclusion, which is that we want to bring to the market, we want to enable enterprises and companies and governments, financial institutions, people in many different sectors outside of finance, to be able to manage trust in the digital world, integrate that into their current offerings and their current business as easily as, easy as easily as possible using their own technology teams. And this is what we this is what we do at Keychain. So what we've done is that we've brought to the market a product we call Keychain Core. And what that is is a solution accelerator that technology teams can embed into their applications. And you get all of these benefits that I talked about, and I'll describe them in detail later, but you don't have to, your team or our, our partners' teams don't have to do all of the hard technology work to, in order to get that, that going. It's as easy as dropping this functionality into your applications. So what do you get out of the box? You get, uh, number one, self-sovereign identity, right? This ability to create your own parameters that define identity per device, uh, and the intent is that will that, that will scale globally to as many devices as you'd like to be part of your service. You get data provenance, data security, and this is why blockchain is very important. The last one is historical digital signature attribution. Why is that important? Uh, an example would be, uh, let's suppose in the market, a FX market or a securities exchange market, where uh, there happens to be a flash crash. Uh, and there are traders who profited from the flash crash, and there are traders who have lost money in the, the flash crash. After that event, a regulator needs to go through the logs of what happened and ascertain whether someone was creating that situation or someone was just being part, has just been a victim of that situation. And that's a very important as a way to um, investigate uh, financial crimes. Well, if we're able to have these tech capabilities where everyone's device, the trader, the financial institution, the, uh, the, uh, the, the exchange, the broker, and the regulator themselves have digital identity and the data has been digitally signed and into and encrypted and stored in a very secure manner, then the regulator can go back in time and verify that each of, this, each of these pieces of data were in fact the authentic data and, and in fact that it was complete. Okay, and that's the significance of these four capabilities. So our partners can build applications um, on top of that and integrate that in, into their capabilities while taking advantage of all of these um, features. Now, let me illustrate and, and sort of um, highlight why this is different from uh, other uh, approaches to blockchain and or DLT uh, by highlighting that these, many of these capabilities, data provenance, data security, and most notably self-sovereign identity, are pretty unique to this approach. Um, whereas we're not using the blockchain particularly as a smart contract um, platform. So we don't use it for workflows. But a very important thing to understand is that smart contracts can be implemented outside the blockchain once, you've, once you have these capabilities that we've spoken about. Okay. So not only can we do all the things that are typically associated with other blockchains, contracts, digital assets, workflows, but we can also do a fair bit more um, that are relevant to industries that have really nothing to do with digital assets or, or uh, smart contracts at all. All right, so let me put this into concrete terms and show you some use cases of this technology. Um, and as I go through each of these, you can sort of understand that it's very wide reaching, far reaching, the impacts of using a blockchain in a very narrow sense 
that, that we talk about for digital identity only. Um, but the applications are very, very important in different, different industries. And think, as I go through these examples, I want you to think about how uh, policies can be, how policy making, rather, can be made a bit easier if you don't have to worry about um, the issues without um, this, this approach. Okay, so first on the list is uh, healthcare data portability. Okay, so um, you can imagine, particularly in this, um, the age of COVID, uh, we have to think about how, if we were to build a healthcare data repository um, where financial, I'm sorry, where medical institutions, medical practitioners can upload and share data about trends that are happening in society, how can we create such an infrastructure that allows data to be securely exchanged and data provenance and have all the benefits that I mentioned, right? Okay, well, applying blockchain into this way gives us that almost out of the box, right? If this technology can be embedded in the applications that doctors and practitioners use, then they could, with the click of a button, upload this data, have providence, have control over it, the security of it. They can upload it into Google Cloud. They can upload it to a cloud provider here in Japan. They can upload it to a cloud provider in some other country and not have to worry about that digital agency problem that I mentioned. Uh, and in fact, um, as coincidence would have it, um, there was a press release released today of one of Keychain's um, partners, uh, Topan Forms, who has implemented a first stage uh, version of such a system where they're taking medical data from uh, a user's handheld wearable device and transmitting that data into a cloud and the data is secured on the cloud until it's being read and, and, and decrypted on the cloud. Uh, and this is just the, the beginning of that because you can think of many ways in which that, this could be extended. Uh, one of my favorite examples is um, I would love to see nursing homes uh, use some uh, biometric monitoring on patients while patients are asleep in, in, in their care in the nursing home and just use that as a, as a learning functionality. And that needs to be securely transmitted and this can be done in a way that protects both the, the, the patient and the, the hospital from, from uh, the liabilities of uh, cyber cybersecurity hacks. A second use case is simply secure collabor collaboration. Uh, within the enterprise context, you can think of any company where the company is dealing with documents and emails and chat messages, even voice chat maybe. And all that data needs to be stored on a network, a cloud provider. However, if the company happens to operate in, happens to operate in multiple countries, let's say the United States and in China and in Japan, Singapore, the, I can imagine that the, C, the CTO or the CIO of that company has to think about this question very, very deliberately, is how do I normalize my company's cybersecurity risk globally uh, in a consistent way? Okay, so this is one thing that we are particularly excited about, uh, and we are embedding Keychain's capability into uh, some of the very well used and very well known uh, Microsoft products like Microsoft Office and and, and so forth, so that we can allow users to very simply get the benefits of into an encrypted data, digital signatures. When an email comes into their office application, immediately our technology will, will flag the email if it's from someone they don't know. Uh, if the email is missigned, if the email is not encrypted, we give the user an immediate warning about this. Right? And so you can see this being used to help organizations and enterprises to protect themselves against very, very common techniques to hack uh, their, their employees. All right, and 
Uh, another use case, and this is, this is an example of a problem of a project that we've implemented as well, a couple of times actually. And this is applied to the problem of peer-to-peer -peer trading uh, of, of, uh, of e-power, uh, electricity, and other sort of resources. Uh, here in Japan, that's a very, very interesting uh, and hot topic today. And so the, the concern here is that how do we monitor, for example, the, the amount of solar energy that has been harnessed by a household using solar panels and to accurately attribute some credit towards that household um, based on the, the, the real metrics, the real median, uh, metering of the solar energy that's been harnessed. So you can imagine the smart meter itself having a digital identity on the blockchain. The data is being sent over on a much cheaper network than they currently use, archived on the cloud, and then that data can be then transformed into some sort of digital asset credit, which is given to the households. Uh, and that can be peer-to-peer -peer exchanged. Uh, or the energy companies themselves can uh, accrue these digital assets and then trade them on exchanges themselves. Okay. But you notice here, the important thing is the data, not, not the asset, right? The data, the asset comes from the data that's collected. And that data needs to be authentic and it needs to be um, uh, secure. Okay, and getting towards the, the last of the use cases. Uh, smart, you know, mobility and smart cities. Now this is an, a use case which is almost entirely uh, data uh, centric, right? Uh, so you can imagine that uh, you know the the current conditions of an automobile at the time of say an accident on the on the road is very important for insurance's purposes and what have you. And so if that data can be authenticated, even if it's not transmitted in real time, after the fact. If you can verify that the data was in fact the data that was present at the time of the crash, then that has a huge, I think, um, ramifications into the space of insurance and, and other types of way, other ways to monitor um, sort of civil engineering um, uh, uh, applications. Okay. Uh, video gaming, people talk about this a lot. Uh, you can use, I can imagine a world, a space where the content that's created by a, an artist is signed and encrypted in such a way that only the people who have been given access by presumably paying that artist the rights, to, you know, uh, for rights to, to listen to their content can get access to that data. And so what this, the impact of this is that this will then shift the focus to hopefully getting artists the be becoming artists becoming the, the main beneficiaries of um, their work and being paid directly uh, based on the fact that the artist can control access to to their 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 files and content okay so many applications of the same concept we're just applying the same modern blockchain approach to all of these different approaches, all these different problems, and you can see new solutions come out from these. Um, these that maybe enhance cybersecurity, maybe they reduce cost, but most importantly, they create new patterns of business in which um, we can sort of see a new economy arising out of this. And most importantly, if this is ubiquitously, or rather very, uh, very, very heavily um, deployed, we can hopefully see an end to situations in which we have to ban entire networks and companies just in order to um, secure our data on the cloud and on networks and so forth. Okay, trade finance, everyone knows that use case. Okay. And then the last use case I mentioned is the digital asset platform. And now we come back finally to finance, right? We come back to what I use, what we know most um, blockchain groups will sort of focus on is how to do remittance and payments, things like that. But having solved the, the data provenance problem first and this related agency problem, 
now you have a much, much stronger, much more secure and private financial institution, uh, uh, financial infrastructure on which you can do better ways to um, remit uh, monies, create new assets, uh, and sort of new sort of instruments um, that you can exchange within the space. Okay, so that is the range of use cases that I talk about. And if there's anything else, if there's anything that I can sort of leave you with is the message that we need to be able to manage trust in the digital world. Uh, because as we know, the digital space is in fact uh, untrusted and rightfully so. Uh, the message I have for you guys is that the technology to do this exists right now. And it is such far reaching and powerful that it can affect the, it can uh, impact the way policies made going forward so that we hopefully will not have these situations where, where we have to ban entire companies and infrastructure going forward. And hopefully companies and countries can manage their own data sovereignty even in the face of a, a uncertain and dis distrusted digital world. Okay. So, so that's my talk for now. And I will stop right there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much, Image to Hope. Yes, we thank you so much for your great session. Thank you. Arigatouzaimashita. では、これをもちまして分散化デジタル化される世界とは、経営層とポリシーメーカーが知るべき未来とインパクト、キーノート終了とさせていただきます。では、ここでセッションのご案内をさせていただきます。Is finished. I would like to make announcements regarding the next sessions from 3:15 in Hall A. We have Exploring Enterprise Blockchain Technology Session in Hall B. We have have a session titled Tasks and Challenges in Social Implementation of Japanese Digital ID. Those viewers online, please choose the URL of the session you would like to participate and access that URL. Thank you.